Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Alicia and um, the sponsors for inviting me and uh, putting together the talks. I think it's a fantastic uh, initiative and makes a big difference. Um, it's a very exciting time uh, for Northern Star, a very exciting time for Kalgoorlie. So, um, the amalgamation now of Saracen and Northern Star um, means that the Golden Mile, this great deposit, is owned by one owner now, and that hasn't happened for a very, very long time. Um, the um, Northern Star has released exploration update in May that really highlight uh, the excellent work that is being done here. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to building on that really good work that is happening with a lot of very good results. What I will do tonight is um, talk about uh, some work that I did on the Golden Mile myself uh, 15 years ago. Um, at that time, it was a really opportune time to do a geological study. The underground was still accessible, so I spent quite a bit of time underground at Femiston. Uh, the super pit uh, was exposing some really key areas, such as the Lake du Syncline in, in the southern part, and uh, I had the opportunity to map those places that obviously are all gone now. So uh, the talk today is very much about geological observations, uh, and also, uh, what I did at the time, uh, KCGM had drilled some stratigraphic holes uh, right across the deposit and uh, conducted some lithogeochemistry on those holes. And the talk today is very much supported by that uh, geochemistry. At the time, it really allowed us to understand the stratigraphy better and, in turn, the, um, the structural framework. So this is a little bit what I'll be talking about. Um, OK. So essentially starting with the structural architecture, that framework aspect. Then we'll talk about the pyrogenesis of the mineralization. And then put together um, the timing relationship. And the focus is very much on Femiston style mineralization and the Femiston deposit itself. Now we've expanded the footprint a lot, and what we're doing is, is really making things bigger and bigger all the time. Uh, but the focus is very much on the um, traditional Femiston deposit um, as it was 15 years ago. So the location, uh, we all know where we are, in essentially the best endowed uh, structural uh, setting in the world when it comes to uh, orogenic deposit. The Boulder Lefroy structure right in the middle uh, of this um, picture is uh, essentially along an uplifted uh, mafic block, so the, the core, the lower part of the stratigraphy, and right along that structure is um, a, a, a string of orogenic gold deposit, the Golden Mile being uh, the larger of them by, uh, by quite a bit. Uh, zooming in to the local geology, um, what dominates the geological architecture is the um, Kalgoorlie anticline syncline. The Kalgoorlie anticline uh, axis is northwest trending, and this anticline plunges shallowly to the south. It exposes gradually older stratigraphy uh, towards the northwest. Okay? The syncline is truncated by the Golden Mile Fault, 
And there is a series of later faults oriented north-south that truncate that architecture. So zooming in to the deposit itself, Fimiston loads, uh, the deposit consists of an array of loads that are dominantly oriented northwest and north-northwest with uh, subsidiary loads that are oriented northeast, the cross loads. Uh, they are dominantly hosted within the Golden Mile Dolorite, highlighted in brown on this picture. Uh, within uh, either side of the Golden Mile Fault, the Golden Mile Fault exposes some black flag sediments along, along the trace here, Golden Mile Fault. And uh, within the Golden Mile Dolorite, uh, at the southern end, there is a syncline, Lakeview syncline, and Brown Hill anticline syncline at the northern end. Okay. That uh, the deposit is itself uh, truncated by a series of northwest reverse uh, faults, steeply ease dipping, that offset loads and move things up. Uh, okay, that's. Now, uh, I'm going to show two, actually I'll go back. I'm going to show two cross sections, the northern part and southern part of the deposit. Uh, the work I did at that time was really uh, focus on um, uh, relogging uh, drill holes along key cross sections at 300 meter intervals, which allowed, after putting together the geology on those cross section, allowed to put together a 3D framework. So before you get to 3D, it's a matter of going to 2D. And so I'll, what I'll be showing you is the 2D aspect on those cross sections. Uh, and there's two things I want to highlight in terms of stratigraphy is really, um, obviously the Golden Mile Dolorite is um, totally edic Dolorite that is uh, differentiated, layered, uh, about 700 meter in thickness, and it's underlain by the Paranga basalt in green color, which is uh, close to a kilometer in thickness. Okay. The, those drill holes are the ones uh, that I relogged and that had uh, lithogeochemistry, uh, and that lithogeochemistry allows to define uh, where the Kalguli anticline is. So when you look at it, that drill hole, for example, just drilled through uh, basalt the whole way. Uh, however, this um, basalt is fractionated and um, more uh, magnesium rich, iron rich at the base and gradually uh, more silicious and less magnesium, less iron towards the top. So looking at the lithogeochemistry, when you drill on the west side, west limb of the anticline, you're drilling perpendicular to stratigraphy. You can see that fractionation really well on a downhole plot. Uh, where you drill on the eastern limb of the anticline, you're drilling parallel to stratigraphy and you get a completely flat pattern. So that way, uh, I could outline the location of this fold axis really well. Furthermore, the top part of the Paranga basalt is uh, high iron toleite, so very different chemistry, uh, and uh, a basalt that is very rich in iron and in titanium. The contact between the two types of basalt is highlighted by uh, interflow sediment, uh, the lower slate unit that was recognized and named as the lower slate unit for a long time. Um, within the Golden Mile uh, Dolorite, there's a series of steeply ease dipping faults that cut, uh, offset the Dolorite and the loads. Um, the main faults are highlighted here, the Australia East Fault, Kalgoorlie Fault, 
and also the A and C fault. Uh, those are the ones that have the largest displacement. There's several more with uh, less displacement on that. Um, the other thing that's highlighted by this section that is uh, of interest, on the eastern limb of the Kalgoorlie anticline, the dolerite here is actually quite different from the, the Kalgoorlie anti, uh, the golden mile dolerite. So that one in different color is essentially the same composition as the I iron toleite. So it's a different dolerite, which is called the Eureka dolerite. And that Eureka dolerite in the southern section occurs uh, under the, um, the golden mile dolerite. So the, in the south, the I iron toleite is much thicker, almost uh, 400 meter, and comprises the um, Eureka dolerite. So that's an important framework because um, this highlights that essentially the axis of the Kalgoorlie anticline is located on an early structure that would have juxtaposed those two uh, different dolerites. So, so it's, there's an early control on the location of this. The Fimiston loads uh, form um, a funnel-shaped array of loads. In the northern part of the deposit, they are focused in the eastern um, side of the Golden Mouth Fault. And when you go to the south, they are dominantly on the western side here, okay, with a few uh, smaller loads on the east side. So that's an important observation as well. As now, we'll uh, just go through the chemistry to highlight what I was talking about, the fractionation within the Paranga basalt. Um, and on this slide, as you can see, magnesium, the base of the Paranga basalt, 8% magnesium. As we go towards the top, much lower magnesium, the same relationship with iron. Uh, the very top part, the I iron toleite, um, very distinct composition. So uh, obviously very high in iron, very high in titanium. Uh, so very different unit. Uh, and that allows us to be able to recognize those units and unravel the structural architecture uh, on this basis. The golden mile dolerite itself is uh, layered, and that was well documented and that, uh, for a long time, uh, and has been documented by Travis in 1971, so it's not something new, it's something uh, has been known for a long time. The middle units, unit six to unit eight, is really the more fractionated part of that sill, uh, and essentially they're the magnetic part of the sill. Okay, that's where the magma becomes oxidized and uh, the mag magnetite drops. When that happens, uh, the magma becomes uh, sulfur saturated as well. So the base of that unit six displays a very nice peak in nickel uh, and also in copper. Um, and that is really, really sharp. So uh, on a downhole plot that has copper, we can pinpoint that contact to the meter, really. Uh, and that's a really good uh, marker. Unit six is very high in vanadium, so that's uh, really a, a strong characteristic of that unit. Unit eight is the more, the most fractionated unit of that granophyre. It's the siliceous unit, uh, and it is obviously very high in zirconium, very low vanadium. The vanadium is all dropped out, so that unit eight is quite distinctive as well. So the chemistry, again, allows us to uh, document the, the stratigraphy of the golden mild dolerite, the Paranga basalt, really well. Now the story about the Eureka dolerite. Uh, as I mentioned, a similar composition to uh, I iron toleite, and, and this is just a, a few diagrams, but essentially you can plot as many diagrams as you want. It's, it's, they plot 
uh, one on top of the other, Eureka Dolorite and Paranga Basal. Uh, and the composition of the Eureka Dolorite is different, distinct from Golden Mile uh, Dolorite. And that's a plot of all the different units within the Golden Mile Dolorite. Obviously, the more fractionated part is unit A that plots up on top here. Uh, but that trend is quite distinct from uh, the trend of uh, the Eureka uh, dolerite. So they're two di distinct dolerite units. And this is uh, a cartoon of what this uh, could have looked, out, looked like uh, pre-folding, uh, essentially, and, and it's uh, showing the juxtaposition of the two different dolerite, essentially, across the Kalgoorlie anticline. Uh, furthermore, obviously, as we go between the north and the south, there is a big difference in the thickness of that I iron toleite, and the Eureka dolerite occurs there in the southern part of the um, of the deposit as well. So uh, now we'll go through the structural architecture uh, and starting uh, by D1. But really D0 is probably the one key component of the structural architecture that we tend to go over. So the mafic stratigraphy is all laid out in a rift architecture, rift environment. And there is a very complex structural setting in that D0 that is usually ignored. But this is essentially what uh, forms the framework for all the, the, the structural architecture that follows. Uh, essentially, we're in a rift environment that has been inverted, inverted rift environment. And, and that is a really important uh, feature from a structural perspective. Um, so early thrust, uh, that's looking at the east wall in the super pit, uh, small interflow unit within Paringa basalt uh, with nice uh, south over north thrust, and uh, here a nice um, hanging wall anticline. That Anticline is overprinted by the fabric. It's a bit hard to see, uh, which documents that it is an early thrust. Those thrusts, um, there's only a few, uh, well, certainly not many uh, at the Golden Mile, and they don't have a big impact uh, structurally, really, in the whole story. So uh, I talked about the folds, so the Kalgoorlie. Uh, syncline, anticline. Now this is the Lakeview uh, syncline. So now we're looking south in the super pit. Uh, and that's when the Lakeview syncline was well exposed. We're looking at um, black flag beds, so uh, black mudstone, uh, flanked on either side by Golden Mile. Dolerite. Within that mudstone, the bedding can be traced across the syncline in, in that uh, fashion. I highlighted one of those beds, but when you look closely, you can see the bedding uh, in that syncline sink, really well. The fold axis is dipping to, steeply to the northeast, and that Shale is overprinted by S3 fabric, so the regional cleavage, uh, which is steeply uh, southwest dipping. So that cleavage is discordant from the fold axis, uh, which documents that there are two distinct uh, events. Okay. And this um, relationship is observed uh, in multiple locations. Uh, this is uh, looking uh, north, essentially, in uh, underground, uh, in a drive on level 20 that cuts through uh, the Golden Mile Fault, the black flag beds in that environment. 
and you're looking again at a nice little sink line in uh, siltstone um, and a discordance, slight discordance between the fold axis and S3 in this case. In the um, uh, Brown Hill sink line, the similar relationships can be observed as well. Now, these uh, folds, the Kalguli uh, anticline and syncline, uh, are cut by a, a series of feldspar porphyry dikes. So, feldspar porphyry dikes and orn blend porphyry dikes. Those dikes uh, cut through the east limb of the Kalguli anticline, the west limb, and the Kalguli syncline. And they are of consistent orientation when they cut through each of these different parts of the fold. Uh, this uh, is evidence that these dikes postdate the folding. Okay, so they're in place in their current upright position. The Felspar porphyry dikes uh, themselves are cross-cut by Fimiston loads. And this is an example uh, from level 20, the perseverance uh, part of the, of the mine, where the, this load, Australia East load, cuts through the feldspar porphyry. So uh, the loads postdate feldspar porphyry. The Fimiston loads, as I mentioned, are in three um, main orientation. The selvage of the loads is typically sericite rich and the fabric is preferentially developed within the selvages. Um, irrespective of the orientation of the loads, whether they are northwest, uh, north northwest, northwest, or indeed northeast trending, the fabric is consistently that S3 fabric over prints, well, the, the selvage and everything else, consistently in the same orientation. This is evidence that the fabric postdates Fimiston load. Furthermore, there is that northeast-southwest compression, which is obviously what the fabric is associated with, uh, that causes buckling of the loads, particularly those cross loads, uh, have distinctive uh, buckling. Uh, so, and I will show you a few pictures showing uh, that important relationship. So this is uh, looking uh, underground, the dike load uh, in one of the drive. So this is Fimiston style uh, mineralization, uh, quartz veinlets with selvages. And uh, again, steep S3 fabric overprinting uh, the loads. Okay. And we can see the, the sample here. Now, uh, cross loads, so this is a view of the back of uh, cross load number two. So uh, this is essentially a carbonate vein with sulfide selvages uh, that displays buckling. So you see the, the buckling in the, in the load, particularly in this location. And the S3 fabric is well developed within the selvage and is essentially orthogonal to the load, so post-dating load formation. Furthermore, uh, this load is truncated by one of these uh, steeply ease-dipping reverse fault, in this case, the C fault here. And within the golden mild dolerite, those faults are quite narrow, fairly brittle. Uh, in nature, and that really reflects the really brittle nature of the whole rock, the golden mile dolerite. Now, uh, looking at the back within uh, the dike load, this is quite a big load. Uh, what we're looking at is sericite, carbonate, pyrite replaced golden mile dolerite with uh, carbonate veins laminated carbonate veins. This is Fimiston style mineralization uh, cut by a later quartz vein. And as you can see, uh, this quartz vein records 
um, a lot of compression, okay, shortening, uh, so it's buckle, and and S3 is perpendicular. So uh, again, compression, uh, overprinting, Fimiston load. Uh, similar relationship in um, the Morrison pit. Just looking at uh, 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 exposure in the ramp of that pit. Uh, small veinlets, Fimiston uh, style veinlets uh, in the three main orientations. So that would be cross load orientation. That's uh, the buckling in that orientation. And uh, again, S3 is in the orientation of the, um, of the pen here. So consistent relationship. So uh, now we've been talking about Fimiston style mineralization, just highlighting the pyogenesis of, uh, of that style of mineralization. So the early part is uh, carbonate uh, brecciation with magnetite hematite. The main part of the pyogenesis is stage two and three. That is the main part in terms of uh, gold introduction. Uh, stage two is pyrite dissemination, replacement, pyrite veinlets. And those veinlets typically have uh, tourmaline uh, association and also magnetite, really important. Uh, and in addition, um, a vanadium rich mica in associated with both stage two and stage three. So it is an oxidized uh, assemblage. Uh, stage three is essentially where the quartz veinlets come in, and those quartz veinlets, quartz carbonate, uh, are uh, quite rich in tellurides and gold, obviously. Uh, stage four is dominantly carbonate veins, uh, and that one uh, grades to a lot of the carbonate veins are later and are barren, actually. Okay, so that's what it looks like in terms of mineralogy. And as I said, the, uh, the real highlight is that it is quite an oxidized uh, assemblage. And that's a key reason why the Golden Mile is so well endowed. And that's what these different assemblages look like. So uh, stage one, carbonate uh, brecciation. And, and these evolve to um, uh, breccias that have open space uh, textures as well uh, with uh, the magnetite associated with that. Now stage two, uh, pyrite uh, veinlets with tourmaline, abundant tourmaline, this, this in thin section, and also pyrite veinlets with magnetite. And in thin section, you see that the magnetite overprints the, the pyrite, so it is hydrothermal. Okay. Now, stage three, the quartz veinlets um, with selvage of uh, vanadium-rich mica, uh, so the, the dark selvages. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, in many cases, with abundant gold and tellurides, uh, that's one of the uh, X-load. This is the, from the X-load, this one. Uh, these veins are commonly uh, banded and display high level textures. So comb, quartz uh, textures, and also uh, plumose extension of the quartz. Uh, this, this sort of texture, this is quartz. So these are textures typical of a high level of emplacement. Uh, and finally, the stage four of the pyrogenesis, carbonate uh, veins. Uh, this one obviously shows the, the fabric overprinting the, the vein quite well. Uh, and um, yeah, okay, so this is stage four. 
Now we'll go over uh, a little bit about the, the dikes at Fimiston. Um, there is not that many dikes in a sense, uh, but they are an important feature. Um, there's two main types of dikes, feldspar porphyry dikes uh, that are quite silicious, quite felsic, and uh, ornblende porphyry dikes, more mafic, andesitic in composition. Uh, the ornblende porphyry dikes, th those guys, uh, they themselves kind of range from a feldspar ornblende porphyry dike to a ornblende porphyry dike. So there's a range of composition within that suite. The feldspar porphyry dikes are by far, those ones are by far the most abundant. Uh, these guys are, tend to be small, fairly narrow, and uh, less abundant in the deposit. Essentially, in terms of composition, they're quite distinctive. Uh, this one is essentially what has been referred to as senucatoid now, it's kind of the, the thing. Uh, and they are, uh, have higher phosphorus, yttrium uh, in particular, but uh, they, they have uh, quite a distinct geochemistry from the feldspar porphyry dikes. Uh, and they have different timing of emplacement as well. So when we look at those uh, two different types of dikes uh, underground, so that's the phantom load area, so that's level 20, just crossing through the Golden Mile Fault and getting into the phantom load uh, domain. Um, the feldspar porphyry dike here, quite thick. Uh, Fimiston load kind of developed along the margin of that dike. Uh, and then uh, further to the north, uh, Ornblende porphyry dike, smaller dike here, and uh, a whole bunch of carbonate veins highlighted in yellow here, laminated carbonate veins that are essentially that um, stage uh, four of the paragenesis. So that Ornblende porphyry dike uh, at the northern end, crosscut one of these horn blend, uh, one of these carbonate vein, as can be seen on this uh, picture. So the interpretation is that this uh, horn blend porphyry dike post date this uh, particular carbonate vein. So just to put this story of different relationship in context, essentially the Golden Mile Dolerite and uh, the, the bottom part of the black flag beds is, is dated around that 2680 age. That is folded by the Kalgoorlie syncline anticline. The feldspar porphyry dikes crosscut these folds and are 2676 or so. The, the one that I showed you there at, um, on the previous slide uh, was dated at 2676. Uh, Fimiston gold is bracketed by those two different types of dikes, the feldspar porphyry dike and the Ornblende porphyry dike. These are not easy to date, so this one uh, yielded quite a wide, uh, an age with an, a wide error. Um, so essentially the gold mineralization is between that 2676 and 2650 or so, uh, with that 11 added or subtracted to 62. This is all overprinted by a, a fabric associated with northeast-southwest shortening, uh, the northwest foliation here. And then uh, mineralization such as Mount Charlotte uh, and uh, a whole bunch of faults uh, post date that event. Okay. Uh, so there is, uh, that highlights the, the range of uh, age of the two main events in, uh, in the Golden Mile. And um, wrapping this up further, this is essentially the evolution model um, folding uh, of that uh, stratigraphy, uh, that D2 event, and then feldspar porphyry emplacement and an extensional event, and then compression at D3, uh, and then later 
reverse faults and um, uh, late orogenic mineralization uh, post-dating all of that. Just to put this in a wider context, um, Fimiston style mineralization bracketed around that age uh, that I just mentioned. A similar story to Jandi that had uh, a similar relationship with uh, Dyke pre and post uh, and uh, the Mount McClure area as well in the Yandel Belt, in the southern part of the Yandel Belt. Uh, whereas um, Mount Charlotte and a lot of the deposit in Kambalda and so forth post date uh, the Northwest fabric and are um, younger. Uh, Canona Bell as well has evidence of early stage of mineralization. And this concludes my talk, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>